Perfect. All righty. So we're going to go ahead and get started right now. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining in. Cool. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today and welcome back to another Cloud Natives webinar. I hope you're doing well and you're taking good care of yourself. Um, if this is your first time here, my name is Ann Lin and I'm the marketing manager at NebulaWorks. And if this is your first time hearing about us, we are a global system integrator and consultancy. And our expertise really helps lies in helping IT organizations move the needle on critical projects by adopting a Cloud Native strategy. And we decided to start the Cloud Natives community so that engineers could have a platform to openly and safely discuss software engineering best practices, explore new tech, and also share with others what they've learned through their personal professional experiences. And each month we invite an industry expert or select someone from the community to help facilitate that knowledge sharing. So if you're ever interested to speak at an upcoming meetup, feel free to shoot me an email at annanebulaworks.com and we can arrange something. All right, so we currently have over 700 plus IT professionals in our two existing chapters, one in Irvine, California, and the other one in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, if you're not already a part of the community, make sure to check them out and keep up to date with our events. All right, so today our guest speaker is Ash Nakar. He is a senior software engineer at Styra, where he is responsible for OPA development and integrations. Before Styra, he was a principal engineer at Verizon Labs and Scion that was acquired by Sienna. Outside of his responsibilities at Styra, he is also a core contributor to the OPA project. In his free time, he enjoys presenting topics around the OPA project to the CNCF and user community and other meetups. Welcome, Ash. We're super excited to have you here with us today to walk us through dynamic policy enforcement for microservice environments. Before I pass it over to Ash, just one housekeeping item for everyone. If you have any questions during the webinar, feel free to enter them via the Q&A chat and we will try to address them accordingly. All right, over to you, Ash. Thanks, Anne. Thanks for inviting me for uh, presenting today. I'm gonna share my screen and then we can start the presentation. Uh, can you all see this now? Yep. Perfect. So uh, thank you all for joining us today uh, and thank you for sharing your time with us. And today we are going to talk about dynamic policy enforcement for microservice environments. My name is uh, Ash Narkar. I am a software engineer at Styra and I'm one of the maintainers of the open policy agent. And I care about developing secure software that can be easily deployed, scaled and managed. And so in today's talk, we are going to talk about OPA. We are going to see OPA's community, talk about OPA's features, its use cases, and then we'll do a deep dive into a microservice API authorization use case. And like Anne said, let's make this session interactive. If you have any questions, uh, either speak out, let me know, uh, or put it in the chat. So let's get started on today's presentation. So a bit about OPA's community. Uh, the project was started at, in 2016 at Styra, uh, where I work. And the goal of the project has been to unify policy enforcement across the stack. One of the earliest adopters of OPA was Netflix, and they've been using OPA for authorizing their uh, HTTP and gRPC APIs. And you have other companies like Cloudflare, or banks like State Street, Capital One, and companies like Pinterest, Intuit, and many, many more who are using OPA right now in production for use cases such as admission control or ABAC, RBAC, risk management, data filtering, and much, much more. About the project itself, OPA is currently at the incubation level at the CNCF. And for those of you who are not familiar with the CNCF, there are essentially three levels of projects, the sandbox, which is the entry level, the incubation where OPA is at currently, and finally the graduation project. And so currently OPA is at the incubating level. And I have some breaking news for y'all. Uh, we just submitted a proposal to promote OPA to the graduation level. And so uh, in the next few months, uh, we should see OPA as a graduated project at the CNCF. So it's really exciting for all of us 
and especially for the OPA community, it's a super exciting time to get involved with the project. And uh, it's a super exciting time for the OPA community, which is more than 100 plus contributors on Git, a healthy Slack community of more than 2,500 members. Uh, the project has over 3,000 stars on GitHub. Uh, so people are really liking the project and using the project. And the project's been integrated with more than 20 of the most famous open source solutions out there. And we will talk about this a bit later. So this was just a snapshot of uh, OPA's community. So what is OPA? OPA, or the Open Policy Agent, is an open source general purpose policy engine. When you use OPA, you are decoupling the policy enforcement from the policy decision making. So your services can now offload policy decisions to OPA by executing a query. So let's understand this a bit more using this figure. Imagine you have a service, and this can be any service at all. It can be a Kubernetes API server, it can be Kafka, Envoy, your own custom service, absolutely any service at all. And so whenever the service gets a request, your service will ask OPA for a policy decision by executing a query. OPA is going to evaluate this query based on the policy and the data it has access to and send a decision back to your service for enforcement. So you can see that we have decoupled the policy decision making, which is done by OPA, and the policy enforcement, which is done by your service. So this policy query itself, it can be any JSON value. So for example, if you're doing Kubernetes admission control, the policy query could include the pod manifest, for example. Or if you're doing API authorization, the policy query could include the request path, the request method, and so on. So basically any JSON value. And so as long as you give OPA some kind of structured input and you write policies that make sense for that input, OPA will return a decision back to you. And since OPA is not tied to any particular data format, we call it a general purpose policy engine. The policy decision itself that OPA generates can be any JSON value. And then it is up to your service to interpret that decision and finally enforce it. So this is typically how with OPA you can decouple the enforcement with the decision making. Now let's look at some of OPA's features. At the core of OPA is a high level declarative language called as Rego. And with Rego, you can write policy decisions which are more than Boolean, allow, deny, true, false, yes, no. You can write policy decisions which are composite values like sets or objects, or you can have strings. So for example, you could have a policy decision asking that can Bob access this resource, which is of type Boolean, but you can also ask OPA what fields is Bob allowed to see? So it's very expressive in the kinds of policy decisions uh, that you can author or write with OPA. OPA is written in Go, and you can deploy it as a sidecar, as a host level daemon, or you can embed it as a library. It's designed to be as lightweight as possible, so all the policies and all the data it needs for evaluation are stored in memory. You can think of OPA as a host local cache for your policy decisions. OPA does not have any uh, decision time dependencies, meaning it does not have to reach out to an external service to make a policy decision. You can, however, extend OPA to do that, but that's completely optional. OPA does provide you with some management APIs, which allow you to pull policy and data from an external service. You can also upload status to an external service, like the health of the OPA agent or the kind of the policy version it has right now. So you can export these kind of details to an external service. And importantly, you can also upload decision logs to an external service, which can be used for offline auditing. 
So every decision OPA makes, it logs that decision, and then you can send it out to an external service uh, where you can analyze it later. And finally, along with the core policy engine, OPA provides you with a rich set of tooling, which helps you to unit test your policies, which helps you to profile your policies. There are integrations with uh, VS Code, integrations with uh, IntelliJ um, and other uh, IDEs, which you can use to author policies as well. So these were some of OPA's uh, features, a high level declarative language, multiple deployment models, management APIs for control and visibility, and a rich tooling set. So like I mentioned before, OPA is integrated with more than 20 of the most famous open source projects out there. And this is just a small snapshot of them. One of the hottest use cases for OPA is as an admission controller in Kubernetes. You can also use OPA for API authorization with STO, with Envoy, uh, with Kong and Kuma and Apigee. And we will see this use case in detail later. OPA is also integrated with Kafka, wherein you can authorize the messages being sent to a high fan out topic uh, with OPA. So in Kafka, there are some topics which have high fan out and you want to control who can write to such topics because it's going to be consumed by multiple consumers. So you can use OPA with Kafka to authorize who can write on such high fan out topics. OPA is also created, integrated with Linux PAM where you can use OPA for fine grain authorization over SSH and sudo. And so this is just a snapshot of the integrations. We keep on adding more. And if you all want to contribute to OPA, one of the best ways is to write an integration for OPA and then have it featured on the OPA website. And so the last thing I want to mention here is that you can take any of these integrations out of the box and without having to write a single line of code, you can enforce custom policies with any of these systems uh, today, in fact. So these are just some of the projects uh, OPA is integrated with. And again, the goal is to unify the policy enforcement across the stack. So how does OPA actually work? So we've seen this figure on the right. Imagine you have a salary service and the salary service exposes an API which allows users to get information about the salaries of employees in a company. And so the policy we want to enforce in English says that an employee can read their own salary and the salary of anyone they manage. So let's see how we can take this policy in English and enforce it or implement it using OPA. So here's our policy and Whenever your service asks OPA for a policy decision, it executes a query. And in this case, your query could include the request method, the request path, and the user who's making the request. So one thing to emphasize here is that OPA does not do authentication. OPA does authorization. OPA is not trying to solve the problem, is Bob who he says he is? OPA is trying to solve the problem, what can Bob actually do? So now let's take this policy in English and try to implement it uh, using Rego. So to do that, we are going to use the Rego playground. So for those of you who are familiar with the Go playground, the Rego playground is an online interactive tool which you can use to experiment with your Rego policies as well as to share your Rego policies. So this is what the playground looks like. And you can see that there is some good syntax highlighting uh, for, the Rego, for the Rego code, which makes it easier to view and debug your policies. So, so let's look at how we can implement the policy which says that employees can read their own salary and the salary of anyone they can manage using OPA. So let's look at the allow you rule here. And the way you read this rule is that allow is true 
if input dot method is get and input dot path is salary employee id and input dot user is employee id and so the cool thing about this policy is that the employee id variable is going to be bound to a value from the input and then be used inside the policy so let's say i'm giving an input to this policy which looks like this and what we are saying that there is a get the method is get the path is salary bob and the user is bob so the question we are asking here is that can bob see his own salary and so if you evaluate this uh, particular rule you get true so which is what we wanted we wanted bob to see his own salary and the reason this is true is because each of these statements on line number 8 line number 9 and line number 10 were true and that is why the overall rule was true and in this case the employee id variable was bound to bob from the input so now now let's say alice is curious about bob salary and she wants to see bob salary so how would that work so the question we are asking is can alice see bob's salary so if we evaluate this now we get false meaning opa will deny this request and the reason it denied this request is because the input dot user is alice while the employee id is still bob and so this line failed and as a result the overall rule evaluated to false so in this way we have implemented the first part of our policy uh, which says that an employee should be able to see their own salary so now let's look at the second part now let's say that alice gets a promotion and she becomes bob's manager so the policy says that alice should now be able to see bob's salary so we need to tell opa that alice is now bob's manager and you can imagine this data being stored in your ldap server somewhere and you can ask opa to pull it down during evaluation and use that data to make a policy decision so for the purpose of this demo i'm just going to write this in the data plane and i'm going to define a object called managers and what i'm going to do i'm just going to say that bobs if i can type properly bobs manager is alice and say fred and i'm going to say alice's manager is say fred so i'm providing this data to opa which says that bobs manager has is alice and fred and alice's manager is fred and like i said before i can you can you can put this logic or this data somewhere externally and have opa pull it down and so now what we are going to do we are going to extend this policy to make use of this newly available information so managers so i'm going to essentially use the information about the managers data in the policy so again the question we are asking is that can alice who's bob's manager access his salary and so if i have typed correctly you should see this allow rule turn to true so which now opa will allow this request to go through because you know alice is now bob's manager which is what we wanted to implement in our example english policy so in this way you can take this policy in english and write simple uh, rules in rego to enforce them and so now that you've written your first rego policy it's very exciting let's try to share this policy with the entire world so you can copy you can just press the publish option and copy a link and then you can simply check out that link and you can see your entire policy you can see the input and you can also see the data that you provided to this policy so in this way uh, you can use the rego playground
to experiment with Rego policies and to share your Rego policies uh, with family, friends, and the entire world. So this was the Rego playground. So now we'll do a use case deep dive and we'll first look at a Kubernetes admission control use case. So like I said before, one of the hottest use cases for OPA is Kubernetes admission control. And I thought I'll put a couple of slides in here uh, as a special mention. So for those of you who are not familiar with admission control, admission control is a piece of code that intercepts requests to the Kubernetes API server before that object gets persisted into HCD. And so you can use OPA as an admission controller to really enhance the security profile of your Kubernetes cluster and the kinds of policies that you can enforce are shown on the right. And so for example, you can have policies like don't pull images from Docker Hub, only pull them from my internal registry or do not use the latest tag uh, in your images or your, or, your, or your containers should specify memory and CPU limits. So you can enforce these kinds of uh, varied policies when you use OPA as an admission controller. So the way admission control works is that whenever an event happens, for example, you do coop, cuttle, create some pod. So whenever an event happens, a post call will be made to OPA and that request can contain, uh, for example, the pod manifest, which you can see on the left, which is a deeply nested structure. So this is given to OPA as an input and now OPA has to evaluate this query, again, based on the policy and the data it has access to and send a decision back. So you can see the decoupling happening here again between the policy enforcement and the policy decision making. And so in this case, what's cool is that the decision OPA sends, if it's a deny, you can also uh, mention the reason for that deny. So for example, here you can see that it says bad image registry. So OPA is telling the API server or the webhook client why this decision was denied. And this is where it's really powerful because you can express these kinds of policy decisions and not just simple allow deny or through false. So this is how uh, in, a, in a very brief way, you can use OPA as an admission controller in Kubernetes. Okay, so now let's do the deep dive into our API authorization use case. So many companies today are adopting a microservice oriented architecture. And you know, that's, that's for good reason because they improve the productivity of individual development teams by breaking down your applications into smaller standalone parts. But microservices themselves do not solve age old distributed system problems like service discovery or authentication or authorization. In fact, these problems get even more acute because of the heterogeneous and the ephemeral nature of microservice environments. And you can imagine that if you have all these services, each of them is written in a different programming language and each has their own way of controlling access to resources. And what, you ha what happens is you end up with no visibility into the security posture of your system. So for example, if you wanted to say update a, a project or update a particular microservice, you would have to take all the policies for that service and then recreate those for the next one. So even when you're upgrading, it's really, really rigid if everything is so tightly coupled, if your policy is tightly coupled with the underlying system. And imagine like if you have like hundreds or thousands of these microservices and each microservice has to decide whether every one of those thousands of API calls per second is authorized or not, that's a pretty challenging problem to solve. And like, don't take my word for it, Netflix, who's one of the leaders in microservices, they have publicly spoken about how important fine grain authorization is and how challenging the performance and the latency requirements are 
at scale. And so what, what we need is a unified way of understanding the policies that are implemented by all these varied systems. And also we need a way to enforce or implement these policies in a highly performant manner. So I hope by this point, you know what the solution is, uh, but it's going to be OPA. So we can use OPA and you'll see how we can use it uh, for these uh, microservice environments where you have thousands of microservices uh, and you want to make these decisions in like a really fast and a really performant manner. So uh, OPA itself can be deployed in various ways. And in this example, what we'll see is how you can take OPA and how you can integrate it with your, net, with your service proxy so that your services remain completely unchanged and you can uh, change your policies independently of that. So that's the advantage here. You keep your service code as is, you don't touch that at all. And whatever policy changes that need to happen will be happening in OPA. So we'll see how this can work and how we'll see a demo of that uh, later on. And just to make one more point here, imagine uh, if your policy was tied to the underlying system and you wanted to update that policy, you would have to go into that service, understand what code that service is using, like Java or Go or Ruby or Python, and then change the policy, release a new version of your service every time you had to make a policy change. So you can think about how difficult that is to manage, how cost intensive that is, and it's going to add uh, latency to your overall development process. And so that's the cool thing here is that you keep your application code as is, you don't touch it, and you can manage policies independently using OPA. Okay. Uh, so the way we're going to look at this is using Envoy. We look at this approach using Envoy. So for those of you who are not familiar with Envoy, it's a layer seven proxy and communication bus. So where this typically works is that say you have your Kubernetes pod and inside your pod, you're going to have your application container and an Envoy sidecar. So whenever it gets a request, it's handled by Envoy. Envoy sends it to the application gets a response back and sends that response back to the end user. You can now inject OPA into this flow by using an external authorization filter, which basically calls out to an external authorization service to decide whether an incoming request should be allowed or not. So in this case, the external authorization service is going to be OPA and Envoy was going to provide OPA the entire context in the request so that OPA can use that to make an informed decision about the fate of that incoming request. So OPA is going to send a decision back based on the policy evaluation. If OPA denies that request, Envoy sends a 403 back to the client. And if OPA allows the request, Envoy, like before, sends it to the application gets the response and sends that response back to the end user. So again, in this way, we, again, you see the common pattern here. We are decoupling the policy enforcement, which is done by Envoy and the policy decision-making, which is done by OPA. And using this pattern, you can enforce custom policies like ingress policies or egress policies or application level, application level policies using this kind of integration with OPA and Envoy. And we're gonna see a demo of this uh, really soon. In fact, it's demo time. Uh, so before uh, I jump into the demo, uh, let's, if y'all have any questions so far, uh, I, I can answer those and then we can move on to the demo. Perfect, thank you, Ash. So there is one question. Um, so in case this data comes from an external source, how do I invoke or pass that data attribute? Let's say I have the ownership metadata that indicates that hierarchy i.e. Fred's boss is Bob and some SQL, no SQL. Adding to that, what are some best practices patterns for storing that extra data? That, that's a great question. So uh, that's typically what we've seen. Uh, users have data stored on their external server somewhere. And 
there are multiple ways OPA can get that data. So one way OPA does that is using its bundle feature. So you can point OPA to your external service and OPA is essentially going to pull down policies and data periodically and use that data uh, in the policy evaluation. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to, that, that's a pull model. The other way is the push model. You can use OPA's REST APIs to push policy and push data into OPA and have OPA use that during evaluation. Another way is during the evaluation itself. So there are certain capabilities in OPA wherein it can, during policy evaluation, make an external HTTP call, fetch relevant data, and use that in the policy. So there are multiple ways to feed policy and data to OPA. It depends on uh, your latency requirements. It depends on how frequently the data is changing. And so it's very flexible in that way. I hope that kind of answered your question. Perfect, thank you. Cool, so uh, let's move on. Uh, let's do a quick demo of the API authorization use case. Okay, so uh, we've seen this setup before. You have inside your pod, you have an Envoy container, you have OPA, and you have the application container. And in this demo, what's gonna happen is your application is going to expose a people endpoint, which provides information about the employees in a company X, let's say company X. So your application is exposing an endpoint and we are gonna have two end users. One is Alice and one is Bob. Alice is given a guest role, Bob is given an admin role and both these users are trying to access employee information from your application and the policies that we want to enforce are highlighted in blue here. So the, the policies we will demo is that can Alice, who is a guest, access employee information? The policy is gonna allow that. So we are gonna see this. Uh, can Alice, as a guest, create a new employee? So we are gonna deny that. Can Bob, as an admin, get employees or see employees? We are gonna allow that. And can, can Bob, as an admin, create employees? We are going to allow that as well. But the caveat here is that Bob cannot create any employees with the same first name as himself. So you cannot, Bob cannot create an employee with the first name Bob, essentially. So we are going to try to demo these five scenarios of Alice as a guest trying to access and uh, create employees. Bob as an admin trying to access and create employees and see how these different interactions work out. So before we do that, uh, Envoy, like I said, it has to, when it contacts OPA, when it queries OPA, it sends some kind of an input to OPA. And in this case, the input is going to consist of the method like get, post, put, delete. It's going to contain the path that the user is trying to access and it's going to contain the user's token. And so this is what the user's token looks like. It, it's, a, it's a JOT. And what OPA is going to do is OPA is going to decode this JOT inside the policy and then use the claims in that token to make a policy decision. So you can see that when, I, when, when OPA decodes that JOT, the claims are the role the expiry time of the token, for example, and the sub, which is like a base 64 encoded uh, version of the name of the end user. So now uh, let's try to demo this. Okay, so essentially I have the setup running on my machine right now. And uh, so I have a pod running and if I do, I describe this pod. So you can see that it has three containers in the pod. One is the application container, one is the Envoy container, and one is the OPA container. So like in the figure, we have three containers running in this pod. And the first thing we'll try to simulate is Alice doing a get call. So we'll try to simulate this call first. Uh, so I just have like a small script for this. And essentially it's just a curl call. 
and the curl call has Alice's token, like we saw before, and it makes a API request to the slash people endpoint and gets the response. So let's see, can Alice get information from the application? So yeah, it's, it's allowed. So you can see that Alice was able to get information, which is what we wanted. Now we'll do the Alice post scenario. In the Alice post scenario, Alice, who is a guest, is trying to create a new employee. So again, I have a small script for that. And now if the policy is getting enforced properly, this should get denied. So you can see the 403 forbidden. And this happened because OPA denied the request and then Envoy sent a 403 back to the client. Now let's look at the third one, which is a Bob doing a get. So the Bob get scenario. So let's again do Bob get. You can see that Bob is allowed to do a get. He can get information about employees. And now let's do a Bob post. So Bob is an admin and Bob is trying to create a new employee. So let's do Bob post. So if the policy is enforced correctly, Bob should be allowed to create a new employee. He is. So if you do a get again, you can see that the new employee Bob created, Charlie is now there. So Bob is allowed to create an employee as well as get an employee. And let's look at the last one in which Bob tries to create a new employee with his first name as himself. So I can show you all the script that I have for this. And you can see it's a simple curl request with a post call. And the first name in the request body is Bob. So Bob is trying to create a user with the first name as himself. So now if I try to run this, if the policy is enforced correctly, this request should be denied. And you can see that OPA denied the request and as a result, Envoy sent a 403 back to the end user. So in this way, you can enforce these uh, rules using OPA and Envoy, and you can have these multiple interactions between them. Uh, if you all want to try out this policy, there is a link to that policy. Uh, you'll see different test cases as well uh, in that link. So you can see how OPA decodes the job and how OPA uses the claims inside that job to make a decision. So I highly encourage you all to take a look at this as well. And so, yeah, so this is where we started. We said that API authorization is essentially a problem of can a user perform an action on a particular resource, right? And we need to solve this problem for multiple services in different environments. And so OPA's uh, declarative approach and its general purpose nature allows you to enforce these custom policies by injecting uh, Envoy and OPA inside your application pods. And so now you can have OPA running uh, in each pod alongside your application and make these decisions in a really performant manner uh, because there's no network hop involved and it's really low latency, which is really needed for an API authorization use case. So I hope you all uh, see OPA running in every pod in hundreds of microservices throughout your environments. And so this was a talk on the open policy agent, which is an open source general purpose policy engine. If you all want to know more about the project, uh, check out the OPA website. If you all want to learn these, uh, check out these tutorials, which I just did, there's one on the website, so check them out. Uh, if you all want to know or get involved with the project, or if you all want have any questions or use cases for OPA, uh, you can reach us on Slack as well. And you can check out the project on GitHub. And if you like what you see, please don't forget to start the project. Uh, so that's, again, that's me, I'm Ash Narkar, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ash, perfect. And then how can people reach out to you if they have more questions about OPA? Sure, so if you go on the OPA website, uh, there's a link to the Slack channel, and that's like the best way to reach all of us. Uh, we're always on Slack, so uh, I highly encourage you to check out the website and um, talk to us on Slack. Perfect, all right, so, so time for some Q&A. So is there a documentation or a recommendation on how we should organize our OPA policies, OPA policies? Right, so yeah, so that, that's a 
Great question. So uh, like programming languages, OPA has a concept of packages. And then with packages, you can differentiate your policies in that way. And you can separate or different packages for different, say, use cases or different teams. And then you can call out to different packages and join those uh, decisions into a one high level decision. So imagine if you're writing in Go, you can have like a package foo, and then you can import other packages from that package foo. You can use the similar kind of semantics when you write policies in Rego or OPA. Perfect. Next question. How do you distribute policy and data to OPA? Awesome. Uh, yeah, that's a great question as well. So uh, like, let, let's look at this from the context of API authorization, where it becomes like really important. If you have like hundreds of these microservices and each of them is uh, running an OPA instance, distributing policies to these hundreds of OPAs can become really challenging. So OPA does provide you with some APIs, like its bundle feature, which allows you to pull policies and data from an external service and then use that during evaluation. So OPA provides the APIs, but then it's up to the end user to implement that management plane on top of uh, OPA, which actually does or sends the policies to OPA. And like, for example, we at Styra, we provide a management plane around OPA, which helps you to with these distribution of policies for these hundreds or thousands of microservice use cases. So yes, so OPA provides the APIs for you to do that, but then it's up to you to implement that management plane or the control plane, which actually does that distribution. Can OPA fetch data on the fly and use that to make a policy decision? Yeah, uh, yes, OPA can definitely do that. So uh, we have a functionality in OPA wherein during the policy evaluation itself, OPA can make a request to an external service, make an HTTP call, get data, and then use that data during evaluation. So yeah, OPA can get data on the fly as well. Can you implement role-based access control policies with OPA? Yeah, so uh, we've heard about this before as well. So you can do ABAC, you can do access, uh, attribute-based access control, role-based access control. You can write all these policies very simply with OPA. And there are multiple examples of this uh, on the OPA website. And just to add more context, right? So role-based access control is good, but it's not enough. Uh, if you have like hundreds and thousands of roles, and if you have to, and if you have these complicated policies you want to enforce on like Kubernetes pod manifests, RBAC is just not enough. So in that case, you can use OPA to implement RBAC policies, but OPA can do much, much more than that. Perfect. And then one last question. What are the performance consequences of using OPA alongside our microservices? Yeah, that's, that's a great question as well. So the performance uh, really comes to the picture in the API authorization use case, right? Because you're actually calling OPA in the request path and you want the latency in the request path to, add, to be as low as possible. So the, the latency budget for OPA is really, really low. And so with the example that I showed, the demo that I did, since OPA is in the same pod as your application, it's not an external network hop, it's within the same pod. So that reduces the latency, as well as the OPA evaluation itself, it's like high microseconds or low milliseconds. And this is why Netflix uses OPA because of these uh, strong uh, latency requirements and because OPA can give decisions in such a quick uh, manner. So yeah, and there are ways to optimize OPA policies as well. Uh, but yes, OPA policies are typically high microseconds or low milliseconds evaluation, which is what is needed, especially for the API authorization use case. Perfect. And actually one last question, how to make an open source contribution to OPA? Uh, yeah, so that's a great uh, question. So like I said before, OPA is going to be a graduating project really soon. So this is like a really good way, a really good time to get involved with the project. Uh, there are a couple of ways I would recommend uh, in which to get involved with the project. One is uh, integrating a project with some other open source project. That's a really good way to uh, get involved with OPA and then actually have that featured on the OPA website. So that's really cool. And second is if you go on GitHub, we've marked issues uh, with a low hanging fruit or help wanted tag. So that's another way users can go on GitHub and check out these uh, low hanging fruit kind of topics. So yeah, and always, if you wanna get involved, just Slack us and we'll be happy to share more information there as well.
Thank you, Ash. Round of applause. Thank you so much for presenting today for a very informative and insightful presentation. Everyone, just to let you know, uh, I will be sending out a link to this recording and also slides, um, a link to the slides. So you have these resources to reference uh, from in case you miss anything. And thank you so much for staying till the end. Um, if you're not already part of a Cloud Natives community on Slack, I did send a link in the Q&A chat. So make sure to check that out and stay connected with the community. And if you want to stay connected with the Nebula Works team, also follow us on social media. We're on LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. Anything else from you, Ash? No, I just thank you for this opportunity. It was great meeting your community. And uh, like I said, if any questions, reach out to us. I'm happy to be here. Perfect. Thank you so much. And also on that note, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, reach out to me at nnebulaworks.com. I try to respond to you um, in the fastest manner that I can. But thank you again for attending, and I hope everyone has a good rest of the week. I'll catch you next time. Bye. Bye.